Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyankaheka First Nation. Hello everyone and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick and with me as always is the drug-addled Mackenzie. <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> Woo! Antibiotics! Woo! Yeah, so... We're, I'm apologizing ahead of time in this case for for listeners. Both Mac and I are kind of dealing <laughs> with things right now. I might have a concussion and have been lacking sleep for some time. Mac's on antibiotics. Who knows what this is going to do for an episode, but it should be fun. Anyway, before we get into the topic, as always, we like to thank our patrons and supporters. Uh, so thank you very much to Craig, Jessica, Elise, who are signed up on our Patreon and get an extra episode per month, uh, which is led by Mac. We actually just released uh, one of our episodes. We released it For to the free. main feed. Absolutely. So, it's on nature! <laughs> which, yeah, it's on nature. And we thought it was kind of important to, to release it to the public and just have a people generally see what we get up to on a more general level. Yeah, on Pop Canada. So yeah, if you want more of that, sign up for $3 a month on the show. Sorry, what are you going to say something? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's on nature. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, so Mac, what are we talking about? Go touch today? some grass. Go touch some grass. <laughs> We're talking about post-confederation and industrialization in Canada. We're going to be talking folklore, which is my favorite thing to talk about. And we're mm -hmm. going to be talking about how the lives of people are starting to change and how you can sort of see that being reflected in Canada's changing literature. Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, before people turn this episode off and say like, industrialization happened in the exact same way it happened in Canada as it did everywhere else. I wrong. disagree. Yeah, wrong. Um, personally, I thought like that at first. That, I, you're an idiot. I'm kidding. <laughs> Sort of. I, I, I do admit that I'm an idiot in many ways, so it's fine. But no, actually, I, I discovered a lot of things in terms of how quickly Canada developed or uh, were at least developed industrially. And just the actual details of the whole thing, I think, are quite interesting. So yeah, Mac, I think what the plan for today would be is to kind of go through country life, city life, and then kind of see how the two developed before getting into some folk tales, like you said, that will bring, I think, some of those elements together. I think it's important that we do start with country life because contrary to what people think, it isn't as isolated, you know? It's more like, no, but it's... it's like going, if you look back on the timeline of human history, everything started when we started, like civilization started with farming. Sure. And we figured out how to properly ro cro rotate crops, irrigation, all that fun stuff. And then people started to congregate more as a society. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. then that continued to grow. And then, but then, and then the towns and the cities would form afterwards. So it makes like everything is based in the end off of food. All of our changes come from how quickly and how easily we can create our food. And it's the same with industrialization. That that started because farming was made easier. Yeah. Machines made farming easier so then people could move to the urban city where the, there was the idea that they could find a better life or that's where the money was or the rich people. Yeah. And then you then we develop more, create more technologies, which feeds back into farming. So making the farming better so people can have better food and higher quality food in the cities. And therefore the people in the cities, the thinkers and so on and so forth can then turn that energy. They don't have to worry so much about getting bad food or good food because all the food's good. Or all the food's decent. <laughs> all the food's decent. That's how it's supposed to work. Doesn't actually work out that way in real life, but that's the idea. And you yeah. can track, like, generally humanity has progressed. Things are better than they were 50 years ago overall. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Say, say what you will, and there are still some massive inequalities. We've touched upon this on the show before and some major issues, but yes, by and large, like, civilization as we understand it has brought some significant improvements to like health and uh, like production and so on and so forth. But yeah, it's interesting that you bring up this idea of the relation between countryside and the city, right? How one kind of informs the other, because we generally have an idea that the major industrial and urban centers are where a lot of innovations come from, right? But I think you do bring up an interesting point that in a lot of cases, these innovations definitely started in the countryside. 
or at least in the time period that we're talking about now in the 19th century yeah. like the it's mid-19th the century. idea like, and it's still it's the basic flow chart of the maslow pyramid of needs you know you start you didn't it's just like your tech innovations will follow us the same way they start with what they need to innovate and what they need to do to find like the basics of survival food water shelter etc and then when you've got that handled then you can start innovating for the rest of the pyramid all the way up to self-actualization right absolutely so actually when we look at for example the 19th century in terms of like concrete concrete examples in this period, you would have seen actually the beginnings of ironworks being made, which for the longest time wouldn't have necessarily been at the forefront of what people would have produced. Most of human history was, um, was using wood or other types of basic materials in order to make their homes, their railways, so on and so forth. And metal and ironworks or metallurgy in general was kind of used on a more specific level for like eventually trains and things like this uh, or swords. Um, so it's really during this time that you'll kind of see it expand in terms of what it's used for. Right. Uh, so ironworks would have been made, would have been used much more uh, increasingly in households. Uh, they would have been much more useful for uh, like farming equipment, as we were mentioning, and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. Now, obviously, we're not talking about like highly mechanized things here right? in the middle of the 19th century, <laughs> but um, you do definitely get to see like initial um, items being made like threshers uh, and an early, somewhat early version of, I guess, what you could call a tractor, right? Which would help farmers um, collect the stuff that they're making on the land. Furthermore, it's kind of interesting, and this comes back to another thing that you were bringing up of job creation, in a sense, broadly speaking, where ironworks in the countryside would have provided additional and seasonal part-time work, right? Whereas a lot of people in the countryside would have been farmers most of the time. The addition of ironworks or blacksmiths and things like that would have definitely provided in some kind of extra income or a bit more diversity to what would have right. been a well, very... Especially, yeah, especially, you know, for farmers going into the winter time, having the ability to then go do seasonal work in the ironworks would have helped just like alleviate some of the problems and sort of give them steady income throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So... A lot of this would have been rather, um, rather attractive, right, uh, to a lot of the inhabitants because when you're when you don't have like when there's what four or five months of the year where you can't necessarily produce on your farm, what happens? Well, you move away from the farm, <laughs> right? You go somewhere else. You go to the city. Well, because now this is not disparaging on farms, but mm -hmm. farming is hard work. Yeah, yeah, and you know, like I don't. I'm sure it's a lot of people love to be farmers, but to do that manual hard, like the manual, manual labor, it's not the job that a lot of people aspire to. Mm -hmm. So then, then people have the opportunity to then move to, and I also think it's the fact the farmers didn't need to hire so many people. So yes, jobs were created with the ironworks, but then a lot of jobs were also lost. Yes. Because with the advent of machines, farmers didn't need as much help. So therefore, these people without jobs were then able to move to the city and they found other jobs and or they just started working at the ironworks full time. Exactly. And like definitely what you saw in those initial ironworks were definitely like what we'd conceive of as a traditional like blacksmith type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing was also is that it's kind of, I think what you're kind of alluding to is this double-edged sword. So what you see, for example, in the countryside is this increase in production, for example. So you have better farming equipment that you make with your iron, um, with your iron. So it creates better food, your population is healthier, um, or it creates more food at least, your population is healthier, you're allowed, to, uh, you get more children out of it. So you definitely see, for example, within this time, an increase in fertility, right? Now, again, this comes back to what you're saying is that you see uh, during this time that people have difficulty a bit, um, how, how could I say this? How could I put this? Have difficulty fulfilling all the work that needs to be done right because there's too many there's almost too many people for the amount of work that needs to be done on a farm right and some of them don't want to do as you say the work on the farm because it's very hard work and so it almost creates the conditions in which people will go to the city anyway right um and so yeah it's just kind of this vicious cycle in which kind of inevitably leads to uh, a movement towards the city and as you say then 
people will, and that's where you see most of the industrialization and mechanization of what had been done in the country. Well, that, that's the, that's our biggest idea of what the industrialization and mechanization looks like, because you have the room to put all the mechanization in. In the farmland, you have to keep the farmland. You can't just get rid of it all. You need food, you need farmland for food. Therefore, you can only industrialize and mechanize so much of it. Absolutely. So actually, th this is kind of a question for you, because I know you're interested in industrialization. So with that advent, right, during the, uh, of like mechanizing mostly in the urban areas, right, where it would be much more centralized and easy to do that, what do you think happened to the agricultural sectors, like the country sectors? What do you think they chose to do in the face of that, right? Mm -hmm. So are you saying they were like, did they like embrace the change or fight the change? Yeah. I think they'd go with it in the end. Interesting. Just because, like, they'd start, they'd probably resist at the beginning because we're stubborn like that. But in the end, humanity is also, like, a species based on change, rapid mm -hmm. change as well. So I think in the end, they would, like, they would start, they would, they would, they couldn't, they wouldn't do the same. Yeah. Whether they either embrace the technology or they turn to a different direction with it, they wouldn't stay the same because they couldn't. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's pretty much what happened. At first, what you see is country life kind of returning to its agricultural roots and being hyper-specific in what it produced, um, mostly focusing on subsistence farming um, and leaving basically the city to do the mass producing, which we'll get into, which inevitably, again, kind of reinforces some of the issues that we were just bringing up, right? So it just basically led to more young men looking for better opportunities elsewhere than in the country. Whether that is to look for land grants elsewhere or to look for, for expansive work opportunities in the towns. Basically, this kind of resistance definitely led to what you're talking about. And inevitably, it would lead to a lot of farmers just embracing the change and bringing in a lot of the mechanization uh, right. processes that had been occurring during the mid-19th century. Well, you just you don't have much of a choice at some point. You know, at some point, you really have to take a look at it and say, what's inevitable, what isn't? Yeah, you absolutely. Know? And the sooner you do it, the easier it's going to be. That's the real bitch. Yeah. Take a look at, I mean, the modern, in our, the modern equivalent is green technology and renewable energy. Mm -hmm. It's what's happening. It is like we see, it is what's, it is the inevitable route. But then, you know, the countries that embrace it faster are going to be better off than the ones that don't. Yeah, absolutely. But the, I think there's something to be said about finding that balance, right? Because there's a reason why agricultural production was, uh, or at least worked to a certain extent in the first case, right? In the first place. And so, entirely going on one end or another also leads to certain forms of disaster as well. So uh, I do think it's kind of interesting that there was that resistance and even in accepting the whole process that you still maintained those agricultural ties even while mechanizing to a certain extent and which could have easily gone into a completely different direction and just completely mechanized everything. So yeah, that's just a general overview so far of country life. By the mid-19th century, mostly still agricultural, some mechanization taking place. By and large, we're seeing an increasing move towards the cities for a variety of reasons. So if we shift more towards city life, right? Around the same time, around 1850s, 1860s, what's your kind of general perception of the Canadian sphere of city life at this time, right? Because I know we were industrialized, you know, since we sort of talked about it a bit before, but mm -hmm. I also know that was more of the focus, like the big, because the big thing is the train. If you're yes. going to have a railroad, a railroad requires an industrialized nation to have, to support it. Or at least to create it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah at least to create it. Like, because mm -hmm. how the fuck else are you going to make the engines, the railways, the steel, Important. and all those other... Can yeah. Canada did not have the economy for that. And would it be no. counter it would be totally counterproductive for what Johnny McDonald wanted to do, which was create yes. sort of like a self-sustaining nation. Mm -hmm. So I can probably and I live like I live in Montreal, an apartment Montreal that used to be very like filled with factories and all it's all being torn down for condos now. But I still see the fit in five roses sign when I go for a walk outside. Yeah. So I can definitely see the industrialization being there and taking place mm -hmm. and definitely on the rise. But as we sort of talked about again before, 
the fact of the matter is, Canada, while in a large nation now, it was not a very populated nation. Right. Absolutely. So while we would, like per capita, we would have lots of industrialized people, the overall <laughs> level <laughs> would probably be lower compared to larger nations with higher populations. Yeah, probably. Um, I, I'd have to, I, I know I have some stats somewhere in my notes. Um, yeah, so... It's from about 1851 to 1861, so around the period that we're talking, about 13% of British North Americans lived in cities of 20,000 people or more, right? Which put the, uh, the emerging nation above the world average of about 5%, right? Which is still significant, but as you're saying, you kind of have to look at why those stats are the way they are, right? <laughs> in a country the size of Canada, which at the time would have housed a couple million people, not even, you know, it's either be in a, in a countryside that is barely able to sustain that level of people, or you just agglomerate uh, because it's the best way to survive, <laughs> right? There's something to say about that, but I, I think you brought that up pretty succinctly. So in terms of like an overall view of city life, Canada was actually one of the first colonies to actively industrialize uh, during the 19th century. Obviously, it did so after such European nations as Great Britain or Belgium, which at the time had systematic powerhouses in order to exploit their own colonies, right? So Great Britain was able to, to at this time, exploit a great deal of Africa and India and so on in order to industrialize its own nation. And Belgium did the same thing with the Congo, right? So those were two of the most significant European countries that were able to industrialize. And Canada was not far behind um, in terms of that. And it industrialized rather contemporaneously with France um, and a bit behind the US, although contrary to like our popular belief, we didn't industrialize like that late behind the US. Mm -hmm. um, we estimate, or at least modern historians estimate that it's about 10 years or so behind the US, which is not that bad in terms of the grand scheme of things. Um, and it was actually ahead of some, some European countries like Germany, Italy, Russia, and even Japan. Right? Yeah. Well, Japan's big boom came more after the world wars and they just learned to like reverse engineer everything. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And they were kind of forced to, to as well, right? By the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> right? we, we, and it's yeah. hard for ours because you have to look like industrialization in Canada is just always going to be different because of how our economy shaped up mm -hmm. to always be a thing of like furs, food, like natural resources. So you can only industrial, again, like well, as we said before, you can only industrialize so much. Right. Before or at least really so quickly. Yeah. Or only so quickly before you start, like you have to do it in such a way that you can still sustainably harvest the resources that you need yes if you want that economy to continue to grow and sort of be stable and all that other stuff yeah i think also there's something to be said probably because if you look at the type of countries right so we're faster than germany italy spain so on so forth all these countries that had kind of dropped below the imperial game they had some colonies in like africa and so on and so forth in south america nice. the but scramble it, for africa but it was comparatively less for example than countries like france or great britain right and so there is something to be said about who owns what and how you can exploit certain populations right which allows these countries to definitely industrialize much faster and there's probably something to be said in Canada about the fact that by the 18th century, right, uh, by the 19th century, sorry, the mid-19th century when we're talking, like the people who are at least most advantaged and definitely prioritized in terms of job creation and mechanization, industrialization, are British Canadians, right? Jobs! Right. So you... you Capitalism! Yo, yeah, we're going to get into that one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's um, rip it in half. <laughs> <laughs> but there is something to be said, right? Whereas the other like colonies, for example, that Great Britain had in India or in Africa, you know, they were still considered to be lesser populations in many ways. And there wasn't this active push to help them industrialize as much, right? Uh, contrary to what you saw in Canada. So you get into this whole idea of imperialism, obviously, but I think that's something worth noting. Woo! Imperialism. No, but it is something that I think is relevant to, to, to think about as to why Canada would have been one of the first countries to industrialize, right? Right. I, I think, 
uh, sort of building on what you said, I think it was because we were we were a place with resources, but we weren't as exploited as, say, somewhere in the Caribbean. Yes, exactly. So that gave us an ability to sort of, to keep, we could be, like, we had more negotiating power, you know? Mm -hmm. When we got to the table, we were allowed to keep our resources, keep what we were doing, and all that other sort of stuff. So we weren't as exploited. Yeah, absolutely. Now, y you mentioned a few times the idea of the types of resources that we had. So the fish, furs, wood, right? Even wheat as we expanded west. Right? Um, now, there is some debate among historians as to like whether industrialization was a result of a late, late effect of McDonald's national policy. Right. Or if it was under the Laurier government at the turn of the century, um, probably it's a bit of both. But I do think it was important. It's kind of important to bring up the fact that what you mention is a historical debate um, mm -hmm. that's kind of interesting of like what exactly um like how much we relied on certain exports or staple uh, staple products, like how much did that help in industrialization? Right? Yeah. So until the 1860s, most cities in Canada would be relatively small, right? like we were saying, with most buildings being made of wood. They were cities yeah. insofar as they had industries, basically, and that they were central to the economy. But I don't think it's fair to imagine them as we'd imagine like Montreal, for example, or Vancouver today. Right? It's mm -hmm. not at all the same type of thing that we're saying. So... Montreal, Halifax, all these places, they were called cities and they had high populations before the 1860s because they were basically on the water routes, right? And that a lot of immigrants uh, immigrants or in, uh, industrialists, producers would stop there, right? Not because they were any big cities by any stretch of the imagination. No, but you're in the right place at the right time. Exactly, right. So it was during and after the 1860s that things started to shift to what we'd now understand as like a modern um, modern urban landscape. So I do think it's kind of interesting that like modern right around urban. the time... What are you saying? Modern urban! I'm going to have to edit so much of this out. <laughs> but urban! So it, I do think it's kind of interesting that like right around the time when a lot of people consider Canada to have become its own Canada? thing, right, in 1867, that's when you kind of see very clearly the shift towards um, a more urban center. Right. It's during this time that you see the increasing deliberate planning of cityscapes, the construction of durable buildings that are made out of the iron that's sometimes produced, although increasingly produced in the urban cities, but that's sometimes produced in the countryside. You start to see the development of waterways and canals in order to favor the passage of boats within the cities or around the cities. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting is like on a population level, there seems to have been a kind of optimism that came with the visible progression or transition rather of the age. So if you see a lot of people writing around this time, especially in like newspapers or even some more literary things, you'll definitely see a kind of pride that's being given with like, oh, look, this is what we're building towards, right? We're building this towards- Canada. Yeah, exactly. So you're building towards this like something larger, new and modern, right? That's radically different than everything that we've kind of known before then in terms of like very- traditional buildings right and mm -hmm. infrastructures so the what's what's kind of interesting here is that mostly in terms of consumption and markets that's kind of something that will come later in terms of a modern development so to speak right so you'll have the infrastructures that are very modern you'll have the railways and the canals and so on but for example you won't necessarily see something like shop agglomerations, something like you'd see on St. Catherine Street, for example. Mostly at this time, we're still dealing with public markets. Why not? Yeah. I Probably because there was still this idea that I don't think we had gotten to this idea that we could industrialize or mechanize like marketability, like the, the market yet. 
right? Okay. I don't, I just don't think it had come to people's ideas yet. Well, I um, think part of me is also wondering if, because again, this is Canada. Mm -hmm. So part of me is also wondering if the, the more rural French population wanted to keep their public markets mm. to trade amongst themselves. And that's why it took so long because they were more like they were more French versus English, low down versus the up there. So we have to sort of support each other type situation. Right. Yeah, that's po that, yeah, I can see that very much happening. Um, it's also possible, it's one of those things that takes some time to transition, right? Because most of these things that you see, for example, industrializing, are things that you already have the very easy infrastructure for, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, you're building a house or a public building or a government building, you already have something there that you can replace. Um, you can replace wood with the iron and brick, for example. A market is something that's that's already dynamic and rather established, right? The relations between people have been going on for centuries at this point, millennia, right? The idea of the market has been there for you know centuries. So to actually change that in order to fit the modern capitalist production methods, right, is something I think that would take a little bit more time just because the way of doing those things would have been so ingrained in people's minds as well. Um, but there could definitely be some resistance on the part of the lower popul uh, like the lower class population, I would say, to definitely not transition towards that. I don't know. I actually uh, did not look into that, but I think yeah, that's an interesting Come on, point. Patrick, whatever. I guess we'll just have to not know now. You look it up yourself. You do the research. Okay, I will. <laughs> We, we were mentioning so that uh, so British North America had about a 13% population living in cities. We mentioned that. So it's kind of interesting. So within British North America, the highest were actually in New Brunswick and in the province of Canada, right? With about 14% of its population living in the cities, right? Uh, by 1851. This would actually increase to 18.5% 10 years later in 1861, which is quite an increase, actually, in terms of a country as still reliant on natural resources as Canada. It is kind of interesting that it would increase so much. Does that kind of seem make sense, at least in terms of like the differences between city and country at this point? Yeah, yeah, okay. it always makes sense. Okay, cool. Again, I feel like I'm rambling on this episode, <laughs> but I'm not sure anymore of anything. Yay, concussions. <laughs> We've kind of addressed a general idea of both, but I think there are much more details that we could provide, especially in terms of how people actually lived. Right? And so we can get into ideas of public health, society, or just in terms of labor relations that are developing in radically different ways at this point. Right? Mm -hmm. So most of this, I think, later part of the episode will focus on the city um, in and of itself. And yeah, I think there's a logical reason for that because in the country, very few things would have actually changed in terms of public health and like the actual dynamics of society. For a long time and you know, well into the 20th century in the country, things mostly revolved around the church, right? And right. Uh, mostly revolved around farming. And even if you do have things like tractors and, or at least early versions of tractors, there's very little that would actually change in how you produce, right? At best, you'd produce more, but the actual social relations wouldn't change much at this time. Um, so in terms of public health and society, right? What do you know about the city in the 19th century? Because there is a lot to say, and I think you've, we've talked about this before. Well, so I mean, are know. you talking about general industrial problems or cause of Canadian city specifically? So like, I, I feel like there are some problems with Canadian cities, but it's also a generalized industrial problem, I would say. Yeah, because, yeah. The, you know, the big ones are plumbing has to start becoming a thing if you're mm -hmm. going to have that many people living on top of each other. Management of property and who owns what. Absolutely. Policing such areas. Like, you're gonna, you have to start taking a look at how they grow. Mm -hmm. How do I say this? There's, you have to start taking a look at a more like this. The role of the city becomes that much more important. The role of city government becomes that much more important to meet the needs of the people. Yeah. 
for the things like sanitization, what do you do with all the homeless people, what do you do with all the homeless kids, so the creation of like orphanages, how do you stop people from fighting each other all the time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So and it's a mad, it's like it requires a giant growth in infrastructure. Absolutely. So those are all really interesting points. I think that definitely uh, open up to a lot of the things that cities would kind of come to represent. I think Your first and <laughs> I think first and foremost is the fact that the city, even if it's not necessarily true, but it's kind of seen as bringing to light many social problems and moral right. issues, right? So that's not to say that these didn't happen in the countryside. There was prostitution, alcoholism, crime. All of that existed before the existence of cities. And as you were kind of alluding to, there's an agglomeration suddenly of people. Right? People are living on top of each other in apartments. They're, um, they're seeing their fellow uh their fellow urban dwellers all the time so there's definitely a kind of watchfulness whether it's conscious or not that's being kind of promoted in a sense right and so suddenly you have this perception that well all these problems suddenly come to the forefront and where you didn't necessarily see them before in the countryside now you see them and now you have this idea that the city is like a den of crime <laughs> literally sin city <laughs> well it kind of is because yeah. again we start to see the rise of things like gang warfare mm -hmm. i mean so on and so forth and you can like because outlaws now have a place to congregate with each other it used to be that the lone outlaw was riding and the lone outlaw would do this lone outlaw would do that but lone outlaws weren't alone for much longer Absolutely. Now, this, again, if we're coming at it from like a mid-19th century perspective, it's kind of building up, right? We're not talking, obviously, about like the gang warfare that would see its rise mostly in like the 1910s, 20s, 30s kind of thing. Um, at this time, you're right, they are kind of agglomerating and coming together, but it's not, again, quite to the levels that we would see later. Um, and a lot of it also, it has to be said, is mostly moral panics, right? Or at least these perceptions that, you know, because there are so, mostly it's a statistical perspective of saying like, oh, well, crime is now, is worse now than ever. It's, is in fact, just the fact that you have more people, obviously it's going to, yeah. it's like, no, no, crime, sure. is, crime only grew because more people were there to do yeah, the crime. Exactly. It's not because people were suddenly worse in the 18th century than they were in the 19th century than they were in the 18th century. Surprise, surprise. Right. But people and like city infrastructure definitely corresponded to this perception, right? So it's during this time that we saw the creation of prisons, of insane asylums, of orphanages, poor houses, right? And all of these were meant as responses to exactly what you were saying, right? Suddenly children are sometimes running around on the street and we don't really know where their parents are, mostly because either their parents are working in a factory or in prison for whatever reason. And you start to see this very deliberate attempt to control societies, right? Or at least the way they develop. There's kind of a rhetoric here that's very interesting is that all of these institutions that are being built up, you kind of see this double thing happening of protecting property, right? So police stations, uh, courts and jails and all that. So to stop crimes and robberies from happening. And simultaneously, a lot of them are also meant to care for the weakest members of society, right? Or what are generally conceived of as the weakest members in this kind of social Darwinist age that, we are, that we're talking about now, in which you will see the asylums and hospitals take over for those uh, people. And that all kind of demonstrates the generalized Victorian sensibility of the age, right? Of protecting certain class values and patrolling all kinds of deviants um, in the broadest sense of the word, right? Anything that goes outside of the very strict established British norms that were kind of built up in Canada at that time. Right? It's interesting because the actual at least conception of these things would make it so that a lot of these institutions would be built up extremely rapidly. So in the 1850s alone, for example, a city like Halifax added to its list of, list of government buildings, the lunatic asylum, the city hospital, a rockhead prison, the Halifax courthouse, and the country jail, the county jail, all of which were built within a few years of each other. So 
you see this definite um, interest in controlling. But what's interesting is that a lot of these things obviously create, uh, like you create work, it helps grow the economy in many ways. And so in the underlying rhetoric of a lot of these cities and populations, you suddenly can associate the creation of a lot of these institutions with better times, right? For a lot of people, obviously there's something to be said about the fact that, you know, workers conditions and prison conditions and so on and so forth were not great so a lot of these people were still suffering but it appeared to be better in the world well it's okay i have this i have a bone to pick with people like that it's like yeah. things are bad things are better it's like progressively like however minute the changes are things are better for sure than they were it's just that now we have more problems it doesn't mean that the old problems are some like i still would rather have people living in cities and trying to figure out these problems and everybody's still living in farms and dying at the age of 36 <laughs> from a broken bone. Right. No, absolutely. No, this is, am I wrong? No, no, no. I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I'm just saying like the, the rhetoric of the time and like how people spoke about it kind of ignores certain aspects that still existed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. But no, I, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Those people that say they want to return to a simpler time, they're liars. <laughs> you, you're like, if you honestly want to return to a simpler time, you have to give up a lot of stuff that you do not think about. Right. Well, there's something to be said about... Go live with the Amish. <laughs> I mean, I'm, no, I'm not down to live with the Amish. <laughs> I like plumbing. I like indoor plumbing. Yo, for sure. Damn. Anyway. Um, I, like having to, I like the ability to eat more than five different types of food. Oh, yeah. That's a hot take right there, but all right. <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I definitely think you're right uh, on, on that end. But, you know, as we were saying also in terms of health and so on and so forth, you know, a lot of these things are better in many ways, uh, the way that buildings are built, et cetera. But in terms of, you know, we were talking about the environment not too long ago, right? In terms of how certain things are produced or how certain things are made or taken care of, it's absolutely horrendous for a lot of people, right? The smog and dust and all these kinds of horrible things that are being done <laughs> environmentally have a serious effect on the people living in cities, right? And so there is, again, something to be said about, well, at what cost, right? And obviously this would change over time. This is a, like a work in progress, but you definitely see the rise of um, modern production techniques that lead to come some, some rather great health disasters and health hazards for the people living in cities. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, or yeah, just yeah, in yeah. terms of disease, by the way, like suddenly living in proximity with a lot of people is terrible. <laughs> it would be too, like that, because there's a lot more bacteria around now. Yeah. And exactly. if you're suddenly introduced to somebody who you've never met before, that's a lot of bacteria that you've never had to deal with before. And then your body therefore doesn't have an immune system to deal with it. Yeah. The problem was less about the changes that were being made. It was the pace that we did it. We changed way too fast. Mm. Like we had so many changes so fast. Right. And that was, that's where all the issues came from. This wasn't a change. These weren't changes that we could like take the time to make sure and work through why everything was going okay. Mm -hmm. They were like, no, keep going faster, 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 faster. And that, and you look on that and that's why we have a lot of the problems that we have today because we're still catching up to the changes from a long time ago. Yeah. I've been harping on it a lot. I harp on it on our pop Canada, but we didn't consider environmental effects when we started making coal generators and so on. So for, for, we were just like faster energy. Let's just, let's go, 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 go. <laughs> The machine drives us forward. De yeah, that's definitely something that's a part of this system. I get the economic system in which we live in. And it Capitalism. wasn't Yes, but it's something that started before it officially took hold, right? As a, as a worldwide system is like, you see this in the beginnings of like the 16th and 17th centuries, like as we're colonizing places like Canada and all that, these massive changes are already brought into place immediately, right? Going from native populations to European style productions. It's like, it's a massive change that happens very quickly. Um, and so you constantly see these upticks in uh, or at least not necessarily upticks, but you constantly see these changes in society. They're being done without consideration as to what the consequences are, right? For the benefit of producing more, or at least producing faster, or for the production of war, etc. Right? Um, and I think at this point in our history, it's when it's most damaging, 
uh, at least in terms of, like you were saying, the environment. But I don't think that it's something particularly new. Um, I just think it's the most um, blatant example of it. Of what the changes regarding the environment? Oh yeah, no, that's the most obvious one. Yeah, we can, again, you can look at public health. You can look at mental health. Mm -hmm. You can look at how the factory systems failed children. Yeah, and yeah, how, we're going like, to talk about that. <laughs> like the massive rise in orphans throughout the world because parents were dying in dangerous factory conditions mm -hmm. and then the children had to work in the factories or the fact that brothels exploded in popularity and you just had a bunch of children being born and they couldn't really be supported and then their mothers would die from sexual diseases. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, actually, like, that's kind of a good segue, by the way, into what you also saw in uh, the cities during this time is the rise of increasing philanthropic movements and social movements that were kind of based in Christian charity and in the quote unquote promotion of a traditional uh, country yes. life. Treating the symptoms, not the root cause. Right. Did you want to Always elaborate more one. on that? And um, do philanthropic things, mm -hmm. reach out to charities, help out with charities. But those are all, those will only do so much until you get to the root cause of the problem. You know, creating funds to help impoverished children is nice, but you have to really look at why the kids are impoverished in the first place. Yeah. If you want to fix the system, if you want to make it better, because otherwise you're just going to be dumping money into that charity pit. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So, so reflecting on, and we saw, we sort of, you can sort of see people trying to do that industrialization with the building of orphanages. And so again, they're trying to get to that root cause, like, oh, the children in poverty, they don't have a house, let's give them housing. It's like, well, no, you have to go even further into why all these children are popping up. And it's because of the fact that there's no conception, idea, or discussion around birth control. Yeah. Or like whether or not it's okay. Yeah. All kinds of things. And that happens because the church has a lot of control in people's lives. So therefore, mm -hmm. you have to look at what kind of powers the church has to have. And then you get separation of church and state and you're finally treating the cause, not the symptom. Right. But that will <laughs> come for another like hundred years at this point. No, <laughs> so, that's some slow changing, unfortunately. Yeah. But it is, uh, I, I think it is somewhat indicative also of this duality that's forming between city and country right, uh, at this time, where you still saw the country as this pillar of morality, right, on which you could still base at least some parts of your life, even if you did live in the city. Right? And so during this time, um, you saw things like, oh, what was it? There's like social Damn, there's the name of a movement that I had in mind that emerged in like the 1830s and 40s that was basically uh, very much centered on Protestant values of hard work and uh, basically traditional living. And it basically represents what I'm talking about here. And I forget the name of it off the top of my head, but there's a bunch of them. Interestingly enough, and this is where we'll kind of be able to segue a bit more into the labor that uh, labor issues that we've been mentioning. It's in these philanthropic and social organizations that a lot of women would end up working. And that's not to say that they didn't work in other places before, much like textiles or they uh, did help on farms. But with increasing urbanization, women would be increasingly pushed out of certain jobs that they had done in the past. And so they found work and um, actual uh, social uh, abilities to help society in social movements and philanthropic movements right, that were based in uh, Christianity. So it is interesting to see like where that shift is happening currently. Mm -hmm. Last thing I wanted to mention, and this will kind of segue us, I think, properly into a labor discussion. And this comes back, by the way, to our thing of the markets that we were mentioning earlier. So for a long time, like we were saying, public markets kind of stayed quite stable in Canada. And it would be after Confederation around 1869 <clears throat> that you can start to see the change of consuming models right, and consuming patterns. And this is something that I find really interesting because you can still see remnants of this very thing today here in Montreal, for example, if you walk downtown. And that is the Eaton Center. Right? Um, so in 1869, uh, Timothy Eaton, uh, who was a businessman, uh, would actually kind of change the model of market, uh, of the market, right? Of the public market. A public market. There's this interesting passage from a book by George Woodcock called A Social History of Canada, okay. which came out like, yeah, I know. <laughs> 
um, who kind of mentions uh, this whole shift that's happening at this time, where he says, in 1868, an Ulsterman named Timothy Eaton changed the whole pattern of trading. Eaton had been in partnership with his brothers in a general store in a small Ontario town. And there he had come to believe that the crucial element in running a good and profitable business was to inspire the trust of one's customers by fair dealing. In 1869, he opened a store in Toronto and announced that he was going to do business on new principles. In his stores, everything was to be sold for cash. Prices would be fixed to eliminate the bargaining then customary in the retail store. Uh, goods would be guaranteed for quality and any customers not satisfied with their purchases would get their money back. I'll never be satisfied. I'll never be satisfied. But it is very, uh, I think it's notable to say that it's during this time that we basically see the rise of like the store as we'd know it today, right? Like 200 mm -hmm. years later, this is pretty much still what we do uh, in, or at least that's like the basic um, model that uh, most stores will run under. And I thought that was interesting to note that this shift is happening, at least in consumer, um, in the consumer world. Okay, so last thing that I wanted to mention here is labor before we get into a bit of the stories that I think will bring a, many of this thing together. So we already mentioned a few um, elements here and there, but I felt like uh, we should touch upon them just to bring them all uh, together. So in one of the books I was reading for this, it says, you know, where do we find largely unskilled labor that will work under the supervision in the industrial conditions at rates that will profit employers, right? As we've been kind of alluding to, we see the rise of the factory in this time that parallels the mechanization that we're seeing. And suddenly a bunch of people who used to make work as farmers don't really have work anymore. Right? So what do we do with all of this? And you know, obviously one of the answers is to find labor, labor from distressed or displaced peasant populations, right? right? All of these manufacturers are small scale manufacturers who are being suddenly displaced by factory uh, production. Well, just hire them again, right? <laughs> um, or another answer is, as you were mentioning before, child populations. Yep. There you so go. There, well, because there was no laws against it, and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. People thought they didn't have to put in a law because it's common sense to think putting a child into a dangerous working situation in a factory is kind of fucked up. Yeah. But if there's no law that makes it illegal, people are going to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, actually, children contributed quite significantly to household working class incomes at the time. Mm -hmm. But as you were mentioning, because of the lack of laws and the ability for unions to include children already to, for the ability to unions to exist in general was very limited, but to include children was almost unheard of. So children were Think regularly about the children. <laughs> they were regularly abused in the workplace, right, and were increasingly subjected to horrible conditions. So there would be slight shifts in attitudes towards children, but that would only come later in the century, right? There would be the report, the report of the Royal Commission on the Relations of Labor and Capital that would very specifically address how children are uh, exploited in factory conditions, but that would only come in 1889. And by the way, that would also lead to another series of moral panics. Now that children aren't working in factories or not as much, what are what they going to do? do? And then you create public schools. Mm -hmm. But again, it's kind of interesting to me that this ostensibly good thing of public schools is created out of a fear of like, what are children doing when they're not supervised, right? What are children uh, doing when we allow them to be children and not work in a factory till they die? Yeah, mostly play games and just chill. <laughs> like It's fine. <laughs> it was rampant. The children were everywhere. What were they doing? They were hitting a ball with a stick. <laughs> the humanity. Oh my God. What have we done? I, I know hindsight is twenty twenty, but the stupidity of it all always just makes me laugh. And I laugh at the exaggerated nature of it. Right. But it also comes... It, and it how nothing comes, has really changed. Right. Oh no. Moral panics are going to be there forever. But um, this whole idea comes back to what you were saying before of saying like, oh, we need, when we suddenly have 20,000 or more people living in a relatively small space, suddenly you see issues everywhere, mm -hmm. right? And you feel the need to control them because then it, what if things go out of control? What if things go out of hand, right? Then you have a real problem on your hand because, well, you have 20,000 people. Recognizing that control is an illusion. Right. That's not for this episode, but yeah, okay. <laughs> 
something that we should mention, I feel like we've kind of been skirting around it, but I mentioned uh, when we were saying, right, the displaced or um, stressed peasant population, right? Th there is something that we should mention as well is like the creation of these factories, while good in terms of production, uh, like the speed of production and so on and so forth, <laughs> and the ability for people to pay for things um, that they weren't necessarily able to pay for before, it creates a huge social shift as well, right? Because suddenly, like we've been talking about labor, uh, about farmers, but you know, there's all kinds of manufacturers that existed before as well, right? Um, and that still exists to this day, but you know, as one might expect, their product costs more, right? And it's sometimes it's nobody, right? Exactly. It's it's always. Um, you know, you can make the argument that it's better quality and that you're paying the manufacturer directly, definitely, right? But this rise of the factory will definitely make these people obsolete in many ways, right? And it's something that to, in many ways we're still dealing with today. So it's something that I think should be mentioned here as basically taking up the population that you displaced in the first place and hiring them in your factories <laughs> to do the job that once they had, but now they're getting paid pennies for it. Yeah, they're getting, like, their state of life is even worse. Good job, capitalism. You won. Yep. By the way, I know that for some people who might be aware of this book, like uh, might be thinking that this is basically the cycle that is described by Karl Marx in Capital. Yes, it very much is. Um, that's not me saying that one should believe, uh, one should, you know, be a Marxist or whatever. But it is something I think that whether you agree with the system that we live in or not, I think it's part, it's an inherent part of the system is this cycle that we're, um, that we're describing here. Um, of displacement and acceleration and uh, lowerings of certain incomes, etc. Right. Um, but yeah, just thought I should mention that here in case anyone's like, hey, this sounds familiar. Yep. <laughs> Very much. Oh, yep. And yeah, obviously he was like Marx was writing at this time and he was very much, you know, inspired by what he saw in the factories. Right. Um, so yeah, coming oh, back, but it's and again, not exactly that his point was not to like his point in that book in particular was just to describe the production methods that he saw, right? Yeah, it wasn't and necessarily also just like why they're so messed up. Yeah. Like I know we make the joke, ha ha, con, but I'm not a con, like I'm not a huge right. proponent because I, I do see the flaws in that system, mm -hmm. but come on folks. Like there are certain things we can all agree on. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean by like pointing to that book. It's like, he's just pointing out the flaws in that system. <laughs> he's not, I'm not saying that it's like the radical change or anything like that, but like, it's just, that's just how the system is working in this moment. Obviously we can mention the, like I was saying, uh, how women, uh, their, their place in society changes as well alongside those of men. So changes in food, in production of food and clothes impacted women because it reduced the value of their own domestic output. Since again, now a factory does that for you. So why are you doing it in your own household? And so- Why are you wasting time? Exactly. And so a lot of women, like I said, either turned to philanthropy or the church or provided services like lodging, meals, laundry, um, and again, so a lot of these would eventually be displaced as well, but um, you definitely see this movement happening or um, this shift in how people operate in society. Okay, so in terms of a few statistics here, the 1860s saw the rise of basically what we'd understand as the working class in Canada. So where it happened rather earlier in places like Great Britain, where you saw working class emerge in like the 1830s. Mm -hmm. um, in the 1860s, that's really where it would take hold in Canada. Uh, so for example, in the 1850s, about a quarter of Hamilton, Ontario's workers worked in workshops, right? Whereas about 20 years later, the share was about 80%. Right? So you definitely see this significant um, like proletarianization, I guess, of to, of certain city populations. Proletariat. Well, working classinization doesn't sound as good. <laughs> um, Fair enough. 
And right, small workshops at this time were kind of dying away, as we were mentioning, and were being replaced instead by Taylorist factories, right? So, which would increase the size of factories and uh, lead to a certain division of labor, the separation of craft labor in the country and mechanized, mechanized alienated labor in the city. So you saw all of this happening pretty much like the rest of the world. The final thing that I want to mention here that's rather specific to Canada right, is the division of race and class, right? or at least the elements of race and class that emerge in this time. So depending on where you were in Canada, I think it's important to mention that the working class would not be the same. Right. So you we were mentioning French Canadians earlier, for example, and the market sh and their kind of place in the market. So that's actually a great part of where the working pool would be pulled from right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the eastern parts of Canada, along with Irish labor and other such quote unquote minority uh, populations, right? As long as it wasn't a British. Yeah, exactly. As long as it wasn't like a British aristocrat, you were basically pulled into work. Increasingly, as you moved west, though, you saw a diversification of the types of people who would be brought into yes. factories and labor, right? Mm -hmm. So because you didn't have French Canadian or Irish populations as much, you relied on uh, Eastern European populations, right? Or Aboriginal people who, again, being displaced because their land was taken from them, had sometimes nowhere else to go except from a reserve or a factory. And so they would definitely be used in this case. Or we talked about this in one of our last episodes, Asians were very much used again. Oh yeah, they were uh, quite popular for that reason. Absolutely. So all of these populations would kind of differ, the, uh, differ from uh, Eastern Canadian populations in being the ones that were most used in places like BC or Alberta eventually um, as inexpensive labor. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much, I think, what I wanted to say about that. Not exactly surprising, but I do think it would, it, it's something that's worth noting in this case. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you wanted to mention that I didn't touch upon in this like overview of industrialization and what's happening in Canada at this time? Uh, where does the folklore come in? Right play? now. <laughs> Ayo. Yeah, so we have two stories. Segway, segway. <laughs> We have two stories that we wanted to mention here. One of uh, both of them come from New Brunswick, and one of the reasons why I thought it would be interesting to talk about folklore in New Brunswick: one, because I had a book of folklore in New Brunswick, and I figured, why the hell not? And yeah. two, because um, as we mentioned earlier, New Brunswick was one of the parts of Canada that at first would industrialize most rapidly, right? Mostly because of its proximity to the ports and stuff like that. Um, so we actually have two stories that we wanted to touch upon here. The first one is called The Wizard of the Miramichi. And the second one is an origin story, so to speak, for The Will of the Wisp, which is an international story, really. But oh, yeah. uh, there's Will of the a... Wisp exists everywhere in some form or another. Yeah, but this origin story in particular comes from New Brunswick. And um, I thought it would be interesting. So... Mac, you mentioned before we started recording that you particularly enjoyed the Wizard of the Miramichi one. Why? Yeah, it's just... It's, but first of all, what is it? The, the Wizard of the Miramichi is basically just about this guy who has, like, a spell book or something and is just a generally, like, magical appearing figure who does a lot of farm work and all that fun stuff really magically, really fast and very quickly. And everybody's mm -hmm. like, he signed a deal with the devil. Yeah, absolutely. The devil is within him. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the way in the folk tale that I uh, in the folk book that I have, it's written in a really fun way because the the editor basically just took oral traditions and transcribed them um, mm. from the area. And I think the first paragraph kind of sums it up really well. It <laughs> says, "Once there was a man by the name of Will who lived with his brother on a big farm near the town of Chatham." They didn't have a tractor or a baler, so this version of the story is from a bit later, but um, it existed for a long time. 
um, or any of the heavy equipment farmers use. But that didn't matter because Will could do the work of a hundred men and a dozen tractors if he wanted to. All he needed was his magic book and some help from his friend, dot, 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 the devil. <laughs> well, because I don't remember if right. they confirmed that his friend was the devil or if everybody just thought it was the devil. Yeah, everyone just thought it was the devil. <laughs> yeah, which is because obviously this is talking about machines, right? And machines yeah. being able to do the work. Yeah. I would say so. That's why I brought it up. Um, but a lot of folk tales also do talk explicitly about magic and the devil. So it could very well just be a magical the tale. The devil is within you. Yes. But it is, it, it, I, I do think they are, in this case, talking more about an industrial devil, in a sense. right? Um, yeah. And basically the story is about how everyone is just super scared of will and the fact that he can do a lot of these things that no one else could and it, well because that's why i think the farming metaphor really is more pertinent because if yeah. you read that that way like that's what all farmers were thinking it's like they were scared mm -hmm. of the technology coming in they were scared of how much it like electricity is it's kind of funky that way it's almost like black magic yo for real though imagine being in a world like i, I know it's hard for listeners or even me to to kind of imagine like it, we're we're a, a generation that grew up with the digital age, right? Mm -hmm. And technology, and not having to worry, especially here in Quebec, about electricity, right? But imagine the world in which we're talking about in this country, in this episode, in which during this time you see an increasing, like very, like you say, very quickly the shift to, from a very traditional society to what we now know today. Mm -hmm. It's terrifying. <laughs> it's it's kind of freaky. Yeah, absolutely. So I do think it is uh, an apt metaphor. And again, you do see in the actual rhetoric of people at the time explicitly relate factories to hell, right? Yeah. And factory work, not only like in, insofar as you're selling your soul to the devil, but just like it's hot, the conditions are terrible and so on and so forth. So the metaphor of hell and the devil with modern industrialization is very clear and present at this time. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it is the, the version I have at least here mentions that will eventually becomes extremely rich. Yeah. Right. Um, rich and, off the work of farmers and industry and all that stuff. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So again, through this kind of magic that's happening, somehow will is m managing to get a leg up over a bunch of other people. Up on the competition. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, and this is one of the criticisms I have of him uh, in reading Capital by in Marx's Capital, he does very much talk about profit as being formed out of like some kind of black magic. He, and that's never going to work with people because their right. capital is formed from their hard work. Right, exactly. Um, like he does, he he makes the metaphor in this case. He does obviously explicitly say that the laborers are the ones who form the profit. But he, as a way of calling, uh, uh, of making it more accessible, he does very much compare it with black magic. And like, it, it's very fun. I thought that the relation here in this case was too good to miss. Black magic. Mm hmm So, right. at the Like, actually, in the version I have, the story ends with, Will had $100 coming to him, but when he left the bank, he had enough money to choke an elephant. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's all yeah. right. I don't what know. A fun metaphor. <laughs> exactly. I don't know what he did with the money or where he went, but it must have kept him going for quite a while because nobody ever heard tell of him again. He can choke an elephant. <laughs> right. But the, the point here was like, I think what's kind of interesting is that with a lot of the way that we hear about modern industry is like, oh, these people, uh, like these industrialists, for example, give back and it all makes sense as part of the system, right? It kind of trickles down into the factory workers and back up. And by and large, there's a general, um, there's a general distribution of the production wealth. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, we, we know that today that that's not quite the case um, because that's just not how the system works. But um, I do think that this story kind of points to that with this ending of saying like, well, he made his money and then he fucked off. <laughs> he just, no one ever saw him again. <laughs> Which I find really funny to, uh, to think about. Was there anything else that you wanted to mention about the Wizard of the Miramichi? It's really short. So if yes. you can read it, do it. Yeah. It's really it's short, really fun. Six it's pages six. on my version. Yeah. Yeah, I got like, I don't know, 14, but a lot yeah. of it is like half a page only and then they move to the next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, 10 out of 10 would recommend again. Yeah. There's something to be said also 
about right the control of the land that we're talking about here right of you know this is something that we haven't really touched upon but we mentioned it a bit with the environment uh, when we were talking about the environmental aspects of saying you know there's something to be said about how we're relating to the land now um as a population right whereas you don't that's it right so we were mentioning in our last episode that we recorded together uh for patreon of like how we imagine Canada as something that is more related to nature by it's the very fact that a lot of the economic development was made by natural resources. But you definitely see with the story and just the general history of the mid 19th century that a lot of these things are shifting, that we see nature more and more as something that we can control, or at least more explicitly as something that we can control and manipulate um, seemingly either by magic or by uh, you know, iron. And I think that's, uh, this story kind of brings it up, um, brings well, that up also, as well. Yeah. It's manipulating the land is sort of the best way to say it. I think because mm -hmm. that's what we learned how to do. And we convinced ourselves that even since we were just manipulating it out the strong, we were still living with the land. Right. Absolutely. So yeah. Um, anything else that you wanted to mention for that one? No, I think I'm good. Okay. So is there anything else you wanted to mention? I wanted to bring up the Will of the Wisp one. Even if I, I know that you, I, I couldn't find a digital version of this, although you do know of the Will of the Wisp story. In general. Right. Yeah. So what is it for those who wouldn't know? Um, Will of the Wisp is swamp gas. It's, it's but, because what it does is it creates a weird floating light. Mm -hmm. The gases sort of interact with each other in such a way that it creates almost like it's a burning light that's floating off in the woods. Yeah. And so people see this, and since humans are dumb, we follow the light, and then we end up dying in a swamp because we step into a bog or something and we drown. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. And so people attributed it then with fairies and the fae and all that kind of stuff, because they were like, we're, we're getting tricked. We're not just following a bunch of gas. Right. <laughs> and their answer was just a lot of hot air, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, but the, the version that I have here... Um, is interesting because obviously like you're saying will the wisp comes from it, it appears everywhere where there's swamps um and there's a specific version that uh, of the story that seeks to explain why it exists in the first place and i think it can you're kind a specific of, version of this story i'm sorry you're a specific version of this story i'm a, i'm in everything apparently according to you today yeah i'm so, having one of those days that's fine i get it antibiotics will do that for you Woo! <laughs> So I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's like three pages long. But the general idea is that there was a blacksmith, right? Um, there was once a blacksmith named Willie O'Connor who uh, came to this country from Ireland and he settled down in the Maritimes. And money was pretty scarce for him in those days. And he could never seem to earn enough money to keep himself and his family in comfort. Um, so he worked day and night over the hot forge and his muscle straining and the sweat pouring and nothing changed. So that's how the story opens. Um, and basically the whole story goes on to say that the devil comes to him, right? And he's like, sup, Willie, I got a deal for you, right? I'll make you absolutely stinking rich. You won't have to work a day, right? And you'll be able to make all the money you want, right? But in seven years, I got your soul. So Willie's like, sounds good, homie. I'll sell my deal to the devil in order to make money. Hint, hint <laughs> as to why I chose this song, uh, why I chose this folk tale. Um, and throughout this story, actually, so he's like, okay, cool. And actually later an angel comes to Willie and says, you have, uh, I'll Willie. give you three wishes, right? And Willie is like, great. Um, he wants a chair that whoever sits in it can't get out until I say so. He wants an anvil that whoever hangs onto it can't let go of it. And I wish for a steel purse so that whatever I put into it, I can't get out until I decide to take it out. It looks like he's trying to control a lot of things and take a lot of things in. Uh-huh, absolutely. And the angel's like, all right, weird flex, but okay, I'll grant you what you want. And so seven years go by and the devil comes back. And basically the story is about how Willie, how Willie uses these things in order to trick the devil to give him seven more years, right? Oh, okay. Um, and so he uses the chair and he forces the devil to, to stay in it until he decides to give him seven more years. He uses the anvil and uses the steel purse, etc. So eventually the devil's like, you know what? You're not worth the trouble. I'm, I'm just leaving you to, to, to be, right? 
And let it be. Let it be. Eventually, Willie dies, goes to heaven, and St. Peter at the pearly gates is like, listen, dude, an angel came to you not like early in your life and gave you three chances to come into heaven. And you chose it to, and you chose to waste those wishes on weird things like anvils and chairs and whatever. No, you're not coming into heaven. <laughs> so Willie's like, damn. And he goes to see the Silly devil. Old Willie. And the devil's like, look, I can't have you in hell because you're just going to screw me over all the time. But uh, what I will do is have you become basically my, uh, basically my agent, if you will, or an agent of uh, one of my agents. And he turns Willie into the will of the wisp, right? Who's uh, doomed to basically bring people into the bog and have them drown. So it ends kind of in a weird way. um, But I do think there's some interesting elements here that kind of allude to a lot of the changes that are happening in uh, Canada at this time. Right. So I do think that it is very interesting that the choice of characters is a blacksmith who spends his days toiling uh, over the forge and nothing ever quite comes to it. It comes of it. Right. He has to essentially Mm -hmm. sell his soul in order to make any kind of life for himself. Um, And I think that's a really interesting part of it i don't know if you had any thoughts as to just my general um oh that works that sounds yeah. about right no but or just even like any other part of it that might have been a little the relevant. list or yeah yeah sure like relevant to this time frame we're always bit. gonna try to make sense of what we can't understand we're always gonna try and use things that we do understand and at the time we understood magic to a certain degree so we tried to use that to make sense of the doubly of machinery and electronics yeah exactly i that's one thing that I, I we didn't kind of bring up but we kind of think of the 19th century despite its um despite its advances in terms of industrial capacities and all that we we forget that there was a rise or at least a, an increased interest during this time of the supernatural, right? I think it was Charles Dickens, wasn't it? It was part did, of the ghost club. Yeah, absolutely. Part of the ghost club. And I think that's very much in line with what you're saying. Like we see these phenomenons, these phenomena happening like the will of the wisp, which are natural. And we simultaneously see in society this desire to understand it, scientifically speaking. You do see a rise of modern mm-hmm. science. But you also see an increasingly, uh, an increasing willingness to think that this could be magic. Right? It could be something beyond our understanding. Right? Um, and I think a lot of the literature alludes to that in many ways from this time you'll see this a lot with hp lovecraft as well uh who was writing a bit after the 19th century but you still definitely saw that right the cosmic element or magical element of science right and rationality that's coming through yeah i just wanted to mention those two stories as uh something cool right? you're cool yeah you're cool dude thank you so did you have any like other thoughts either on the stories on the general thing this was more of like an overview episode um but yeah i don't know is there anything else that you wanted to bring up not really no you're all good any concluding remarks on this shift towards industrialization slow down people go touch some grass take a second to like think about what you're doing and how you do it Mm -hmm. okay cool take it easy Next episode, we'll be covering the Red River Rebellion. Um, That's so, fun. Oh, yeah. That should be a fun and non-controversial topic. I don't think so, but I don't know if it's controversial today. I don't know. Everything we'll can see. be controversial. Who knows? Um, but yeah, we'll be talking about... I, I think it'll be interesting because there was a poet, one of our most recognized poets at that time, Charles Mayer, who was also a rabid imperialist, um, who definitely, who wrote specifically about this. And so I think it would be interesting to contrast his poetry as he's actively looking to expand Canada into the Red River region and the Métis regions, um, and to contrast that with Louis Riel's uh, writings on it and his thoughts on it, um, which would be, I think, very uh, enlightening. Anyway, that's for next episode. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Mac, take us away. Drum roll. Uh, cheers. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Thanks, uh, everyone, for listening. As always, you can reach out with any questions, comments, concerns on Facebook, Twitter, email. Um, you can Stalk always... us in the streets. Find out where we live. Oh, yeah. That's fine. Um, no problem here. <laughs> 
Corner us in the market. Who knows? <laughs> Corner us out in the wheat fields. Um, as always, if you want to hear more of us uh, on somewhat more coherent episodes, um, ha, less coherent. <laughs> no, some of them, uh, some of them are. Um, you can always listen to us on Patreon for three dollars a month, and you can always donate to the show on PayPal with a kind of pay what you think the show is worth. Um, and as always, leave a review on iTunes. Tell some friends about the show. It's always very appreciated and helps us grow. We've reached a lot of charts this week. Somehow we managed to make it onto charts in Italy, India, Estonia, and of course, Canada. We're an international audience. <laughs> woot woot. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone as always for listening and for helping us keep this show going. It's, it's fun to do and it's always nice to know that people are listening. So with that being said, we'll see you all next time. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>